quiet seaside town, an evil lain to rest centuries ago, has risen. An abandoned fortress deep in the swamp holds a secret that could save the village or destroy it. Now, a band of adventurers sets out to dig up the wounds of the past and bring the light of day to the roots of ruin. This is Tabletop Gold. friends, and welcome to Tabletop Gold, episode 94. We're creeping up on that hundo, aren't we? We're getting ready to crack into the third digit. That's a little hard to believe, isn't it? Mm. Let's make it to that century mark. Make it to the century mark. We've been doing the podcast for 100 years already. Can you believe Wait. it? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. It only felt like 99 to me. <laughs> Good. I'm Lars Castine. Uh, I'm Lars Castine. Welcome to the show. Great to have you here. I'm the Golden Tyrant, and this is uh, this is going to be a great episode. We got so much stuff happening on the show this week. I'm so excited to just get straight into it. So let's do that by saying hello first to Robin Lang. Good evening. Good evening. Zoe Chernikoff is here. Hello. Hi, David Chernikoff, Hi. the Tin Man, is here also. Good that time. And our uh, Matt, our Matt Humphreys is here as well. Uh, the- good that time, Lars. Good that time to you. The the artist formerly known as Vadim. We're going to meet your new <gasps> character at some point. I don't know if he's going to make it into this episode, uh, wow. but yeah, eventually. I don't know. We'll see Wait, what Vadim's happens. Vadim's really gone? It It's actually just Vadim in clown makeup. He's gone full juggalo. <laughs> 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 Turns out he was down with the dark carnival all along. Mm-hmm. Who'd, which of our player characters do you think would fare best at the gathering of the juggalos? Let's go around the horn. How would Trill Trill do at the uh, gathering? I think that Trill would do great at the gathering. (laughs) Especially now that she's got her hair uh, streaks in. Oh, yeah. Mag, I feel like not great. I think Mag would maybe be made to feel uncomfortable by, um, like, maybe some of the the more unhinged behavior. Is that possible? Yeah, she she wouldn't be interested in trying to fit in. Take a dope-ass helicopter ride? Am I the only one Googling Gathering of the Juggalos right now? <laughs> I'm actually trying to remember my yeah. favorite line from ICP, uh, which is, of course, from the song Miracles. Oh, of course. Fucking magnets. How do they work? I fed a fish to a pelican at Frisco Bay. It tried to eat my cell phone. He ran away. <laughs> oh, yeah. And they did the pose. Yeah. <laughs> I had the great Malenko back in the day. I'm not afraid to cop to it. I'm not sure that this image search is ever going to end. I just keep scrolling and scrolling. <laughs> no. I knew, I, I've heard of Insane Clown Posse, and I, I knew that Juggalos were a thing associated with it. I, I didn't realize it ran this deep. It runs really deep. I didn't know there was an annual gathering, you know, that kind of thing. So Here's where this whole thing is sending me, and I'm going to acknowledge right up front this is a tangent but what else is this opening segment for except sure. long discourse on hogs and tangents <laughs> um so it got me thinking about Janko jeans because i feel like Janko jeans yes. are a staple of the juggalo community yes right yes um, also of 1998 yeah well, well right it all it all but this is this is a this is the point i'm making i don't want to say it's a good point or a bad point here's where i'm headed how weird is it that jeans, which like should be pretty homogenous, have had such a wide array of styles? I agree. Like the Janko jean is so wildly different than the like high rise bootleg of, you know, two that we talked. This was a I don't even know what episode, right? Where largely we're talking about Sunny's pictures and her own. Yeah, right. High the, rise the, bootleg. The, the, the turn of the but century. Low rise, low low rise in college. Yeah. Sorry, low rise. Excuse me. Yeah. But like, How dare they're you? all jeans. Like someday someone's going to study this as a sign of what humanity was up to. And this like what feels very long in the course of our lifespan. But 
w- was actually like in a very brief blip. <laughs> and like the array of genes that we offer to ourselves. Well, babe, that's the unusual part is study. that is that any any um any uh, whatever lower part of the body, body garment <laughs> made of this material is grouped together by the fact that it's that material. Like you don't right. it's yeah. it's very strange. You don't you don't call whatever. They're all linens and it doesn't matter if it's like a skirt or like or like or, you know I super would argue, tight like, pants. That's, so, that's so odd. A pretty homogenous pant, right? You got some pleats, you got some pockets. You don't get the wide array of khaki styles, but jeans have come to be this whole stand-in. Because jeans you know. jeans occupy like a position in American fashion where they're like synonymous with like the American youth? individualist and and youth <laughs> culture, where it's like what jeans you wear. People wear them as as ways of saying, "Here's what kind of person I am." Right, so they right. they become like a, a target. Like the fact that younger people today will just say the phrase "skinny jeans," divorced of any other context, and everybody else will know exactly what the specific argument being made about the wearer of the skinny jeans is. Yeah, Zoe, I only ever see you from the waist up, so I don't know what type of jeans you wear. Jenko's, but right? They're, they're just I, big. That's right. Yeah. That's As this is someone from. in my late 30s, still pretty much only has skinny jeans. And I, today was a uh, jeans day at school where the kids did, could dress out of uniform. Ooh. And they're all wearing things that like I wore when I was like 10. Everything's kind of slightly ill-fitting as though it's the Yeah, I think 80s the baggy jeans... I mean, I've had an ongoing feud with the the crop, like eight inches above your ankle jean, which is it's like this weird '90s mom jean look. Yeah, and pleats, they love it. Pleats are in on a jean. Speaking of khakis, wasn't there an SNL skit about the mom jeans? The mom jeans one. That's like an old sketch, and those, but those right? jeans are in. Those are the cool jeans now. I am so out that's of fashion in my skinny me. jeans, <laughs> and I'm fine with it. Wait, so skinny jeans are no longer cool? Skinny jeans are aggressively uncool. Yeah. Skinny jeans yeah. are what millenni- old, old, or elder millennials wear. We okay. are yeah. cool. All the cool people in Richmond are wearing jeans that, like, they look like if you ask a, if you ask a, a little kid to draw pants and sort of, like, all they can do is <laughs> yeah. draw a rectangle with, like, a little triangle <laughs> out of it. That's <laughs> the perfect description. But also it's winter, and why do we want our pants ending four inches above our ankles? Like, so that just, they don't... They don't drip through the the salt that's all over the roads, so they don't rust, right? The ice that no longer forms because global warming has made winter not a thing. That's, that's, Maybe that's, that's no. a so point. that when we're walking down the street, we can be identified as a cool young person instead of a lame old person by some means other than the fact that we don't have bags under our eyes. Right, right. Man, well. I remember when I I had the jeans that like where the heel dragged along the back, and so the heel was just constantly dirty with a hole in it. Because it was yeah. always too yeah. long. Oh, Can I man. say something? My jeans no. have gotten <laughs> smaller over the years. I used to wear 38 38s, a 38 inseam, and a 38 right. waist. Sure. Today, I'm wearing a 36 34, and I'm cuffing my legs two inches up. My legs have shrunk by half a foot, I think, as, over the last decade or so, I, and I don't that, know what's Lars, going on. Or you're the victim of pants inflation. Maybe Sunny's just gaslighting you and she's changing the labels on your jeans? Could be. Oh, wouldn't that be the best? (laughs) (laughs) Just that'd be a funny time to find out that that Lars doesn't know how to read numbers. I mean, honestly, not being able to read numbers is as as good uh, an explanation as I can come up with. I just used to wear really big jeans and now I feel like I wear perfectly average sized jeans. Anyway. It's all your heights and your torso anyway. It it kinda is. Well, good for everybody wearing pants out there. If you're wearing pants, why don't you uh, head on over to the podcast <laughs> and, and give us a review? <laughs> hey, even if you're not wearing pants, just talk about how you love our there. panter banter. Um, usually, we talk about reviews at this point. There's one thing that I want to talk about, just while it's still fresh in our minds. We had a great interaction in our Discord that was a follow up on the vinegar rune conversation that we had like oh, several, yeah. several, oh, yeah. several episodes ago, where. Yes. Um, uh, Jed on the Discord came by and showed us pictures of his pet vinegar rune. And apparently vinegar runes are like extremely gentle, like sweet natured animals. None of you listen to me. 
What's that? Thanks, Jed. None of you would listen to me. Thank I'm, you, yeah, Jed. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. Robin vindicated, of course. <laughs> Once we need again. a Robin Vindicated jingle. <laughs> yeah. Why don't we get one of those? <laughs> da, da, da. Vindication point. But there's just something that's like, you know, we have these conversations on, on this podcast. We like, we, we love, like, I, I love the beginning of the show where we just like talk about anything and, and everything and whatever comes up, comes up. The, the experience of having a conversation that we had months ago come up and, and on the, on the discord and then get to have this conversation with Jed, where he showed us tons of these, uh, t- tons of different photographs. Oh my gosh. Jed's yeah, photos are amazing. Amazing. Yeah, one of the, the scorpion that was in the UV yeah. glow in the dark. That was spectacular. Like 40 yes. photos Incredible. and bl- melded Unreal. them all together. Oh, Very also cool. that mantis with the, 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 yes, the mantis, yeah. the, uh, yeah. the, the spiny flower mantis, uh, it's called, yeah. oh, but it, good memory. It's yeah. well, I'm looking at it right now. The, um, ah. the, uh, but, but it's just like, you know, we have these conversations and they, they kind of, they, they, they sort of sit there for a while until the podcast comes out and then, and then to have the experience of somebody coming in and, and like completing the loop and, and, and sharing this thing and, and us all being exposed to like this whole world of insect photography that none, I certainly had no exposure to, uh, was just like a really cool experience. And I just wanted to say thank you, uh, to Jed for that and to, you know, just try to talk for a moment about how like nice and meaningful and cool that experience was. So thanks to the whole discord community. Yeah. We have such a lovely discord. It's so fantastic. Never change. Okay. Let's do it. Let's play our game. Okay. Vadim is gone, but gauntlet remains. Although it's light is not currently shining. Somewhere deep underground, the ghost of Belcora Haravex continues steadily working towards upgrading Gauntlet's weapon to destroy the city of Absalom. With one fewer person to help you, you set out on the next steps of your quest. Everybody, this is episode 94. This is the last episode before we break off a new five. Use or lose your hero points. That's all I will say. So we're picking up. You use or lose them, Lars. Okay, sorry. You're right. I'm, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're picking up on the first of Sereneth. It's a new month. What is the first thing you will do to continue your mission? Well, I think having had a sulky evening alone at Rin's, evening alone post-festivities, Ao wakes up and she's feeling pissed, and I don't even know that she understands why, right? Like, she's just sort of feeling abandoned and angry. She's taking the Dean leaving personally, even though I think anyone... Uh, who's maybe not Ao can agree that uh, it had absolutely nothing to do with Ao. You, you know why Vadim left, but isn't that the way we always take these things? Um, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yes. Yeah, correct. that's how that's True. how life works, right? That's yes. that's being alive. Um, <laughs> I think she, you know, once she wakes up in the morning, she sort of stalks off into town. She's sort of casting about to to prove to what she thinks of as Vadim, but as maybe herself that like he should have stayed. And the one thing he did for everyone in the party was to keep everyone well. And I think we can agree. The one thing that Ao and Norman have always thought they did was also keep everyone well. You know, we can go back and count up points who actually <laughs> did more for everyone. <laughs> um, but, you know, what are numbers uh, when you get to it in a sort of spiritual level? Fucking um, magnets. How do they work? And I don't want to <laughs> know scientists because they're talking shit and getting me pissed. Right, right. So I think mm-hmm. Ao goes on a little bit of a morning Bender. No, no one can lay on hands to get rid of the hangover, right? She has to deal with the, a hangover for maybe the first time in her 16 years alive. And, and I think she's 
looking for people that she can like help fix, right? From a medical standpoint. But she goes about this in a sort of odd way where she perhaps creates the medical conditions that she's then looking to show everyone she's able to to fix. And since she has this disguise kit and a penchant for taking things from people, I think she may be wandering around town. I don't know, Lars, who she encounters, but I think as she comes across people, she's perhaps creating a ruckus, running away, and then um, looking to fix whatever harm she might cause the person to sort of, in this spiral of, like, proving to herself that she, she was, like, she can fix things she was worth staying for. She's better at actually healing people than Vadim ever gave her credit for. So she's like going off on her own and just trying to solve problems to practice, basically. Make them first and then solve them, yeah. <laughs> she's trying to create problems and then solve problems. That's right. <laughs> so she's she's doing this at, 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 in, in some extent for a, a pretty long time. I'm going to let the retraining go a little quicker because of how much support you have around the community here. I think that Ao is potentially caught off guard by how willing people are to let her help them. And I think sometimes it's her, sometimes it's Norman, sometimes it's a pirate. <laughs> the pirate days maybe don't go as smoothly as the other two. <laughs> those but are slower. <laughs> those are a little yeah. slower. Is the same instantiation of, of Ao, Norman, pirate causing the issue or just like the pirate caused the issue, and then later on, Norman Correct. comes it's along. It's always and- a different, a different version causing the issue, running away, and someone else appears to solve it. Yeah. Okay. But we were speaking ahead of time, and you're going to be retraining three feats. I'm going to do battle medicine, continual recovery, which will let the time between treat wounds go faster, and then ward medic, which will let me treat more than one person at a time. This is going to be different. This is going to be a pretty big shift for how this party works. Yeah, yeah. And I think, like, there's been all this sort of masquerading of, of A.O. or Norman being able to fix stuff, and they've never really had to. Yeah. Um, And I think there's self-doubt, right? There's this moment of, like, self-doubt, which causes A.O. to be angry. And, like, maybe if she had been just a little bit better, she could have been the, like, Radu that Vadim needed, and he might have stayed... And so she's out dressing up like a chef, stealing people's wallets, and then coming back as a doctor and um, sewing up the lip that she busted open, taking their wallets. <laughs> That's how you train. This is going to be 15 days of retraining to get all three of these. <laughs> 15 days of chef mugging. Of chef of chef mugging. mugging. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 Otari the, the, has a chef problem. Yeah, the town is held in the in the grasp of a, of a crime spree of various medical ooh, problems ooh, being I, created. and Yeah. I've got the local news anchor hook. What's cooking? Well, Otari has a mad chef mugging the town. I feel like that's Wolfgang Messi on the nightly news. That's right. Oh, I'd watch that. You know what else is cooking, though, is the weather. The first day of the month is very hot, getting into the mid-90s as this training begins. You see people walking through the village down to the water to, to catch some of the chill from the harbor soothing themselves with uh, paper fans as they go. Each day as Ao is doing this, we see the giant's wheel picking up with a new urgency as they're trying to get through the wood created by the busy season from the loggers' camps nearby before the weather gets too desperately hot. On the sixth of the month, there's a boat race from Absalom that skirts past the village. Large 30 to 40 foot yachts swing past the village at the edge of the harbor as people stand on the docks, ringing bells and calling out words of support to the to the wealthy racers. Some of them getting pushed past. in the water by an errant hand and then having CPR <laughs> performed. You know, who knows? And Trill just distracts everyone else with music, so no one notices the weirdness. They just see the chef's hat in the water, like just <laughs> dun 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 A lone dun, 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 spatula dun. floating down the current. <laughs> And on the 10th of the month, it's the celebration of the Burning Blades. This is something that Mag is potentially involved with. It's a dance at the Dawnflower Library where people have come from all around the region to dip their weapons, whether they're practical weapons that they use or ceremonial weapons. They dip them into into pitch 
in a boiling cauldron in front of the Dawnflower Library and light the weapons on fire and engage in a dance of burning weapons throughout the day. Vandy Banderdash spends the entire day looking smug, undefeatable, immortal, just like she feels she looks like so self-possessed in this moment as uh, she knows that it's the safest day to be running a Church of Seren Ray because nobody ever attacks the Church of Seren Ray when people have their flaming weapons out in the front yard. And at the end of that 15-day process, the weather has cooled off a little bit. It's getting into typical temperate late spring, early summer weather. Dew point? Nine hundred. <laughs> Nine. <laughs> Nine hundred. Yeah. Oh, that's a very good dew point. That is. Yeah, it's the best that it's been very yet. Very dry. Very dry. Or very and damp? with Ao and Norman reaching the end of that time with perhaps some more confidence in their medical abilities. What did is... they need more confidence? They just know. needed more skill. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that's sorry. You're right. I, 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 you're absolutely right. I apologize. So uh, now what is the part? Oh, sorry. One more thing. Along the way during that downtime, Trill receives a package at Galantine Deliveries uh -huh. and is now wearing a much more capable set of leather armor nice. as she prepares to head back out for adventuring. It's Sereneth the 15th. What is going to happen today? I imagine it's the morning of Sereneth the 15th and uh, Mag and Trill happen to be going to get a schnook at, at Kirk's Nook and they witness what appears to be like a group of pickpocketers, you know, breaking someone's toe and come to realize that it's like Ao in a whirlwind of costumes and, <laughs> and confront her about this behavior. Um, and Mag pulls Norman aside. So it is true. It's been you running around and causing all this chaos on the streets here in town. Well, it's it's been Trill, too. And he, he reaches back behind him and pulls out a Trill cake and hands it to Mag. I'm not hungry. Norman looks at her and takes a big bite out of the cake. <laughs> I mean, you know. He left us kind of high and dry. We're all, we're all just figuring out what we're doing next, right, Mag girl? I've just been waiting so I wasn't going back to the keep alone. Just kicking back and relaxing, huh? Having a good old time? Uh, Mag has not been kicking back and relaxing. Mag, uh, without any aim and without any, any company, has been scouring the woods aimlessly near town looking for some sign of the Fogfen creatures that have been her you know, intermittent haunt throughout her life and w without anything else to do, but feeling like she has to do something. She's just been tracking around in the, in the woods, trying to feel useful and ultimately being pretty useless over the couple of weeks. You know what might make you feel better, Mag Girl? Norman says getting like a little too close and kind of locking eyes. Want to just hit me? This music is suddenly no. exactly the wrong yeah. music. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to hit you, says Mag, who does. <laughs> By the way, Norman has cast Sanctuary on himself just in ah. case. <laughs> so so where is where 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 do you think uh, Robin, where do you think Trill has been and where is Trill right now as we reconvene? Trill has been spending most of this week in the Dawnflower, I think, uh, looking through their necromantic texts, what few necromantic texts there probably are in the Dawnflower, and working on just getting stronger with Fidget as well. Does Fidget know that Trill has the Whispering Reeds now? Hmm. I don't think Trill would tell Fidget that. Okay, so Trill's been keeping a secret from Fidget. Yeah. She feels like this is such a dangerous text that it's beyond what she's willing to engage with just yet. She's very cautious about it. But she knows it's there. It's at the back of her mind. 
always. Spring. So where is Trill now as this tense standoff between Ao and Mag reaches this fever pitch? I, uh, one of the two of them suggested that Trill was with Mag okay. walking along, and I'm fine with uh, following that narrative. Um, and so Trill's noticed, you know, saw this all starting, and she stepped back a little bit to give them some space. So it feels like this is a moment the two of them need to have. No, Norman, I don't want to hit you. What is the purpose of that? What is the purpose of causing this chaos in the street? What is the purpose of slinking or sulking or laying about this town? What is the purpose of anything other than regathering ourselves, each and all, and re-engaging with this strange and unshakable duty we've been given. And and at the word regather, Norman's head cocks in the other direction, the way a, a sort of attentive canine creatures might hmm regather ourselves, hmm? And and with this he's sort of using one finger to creepily uh, I, I imagine Mag's hands are somewhere in his reach, trace along the seams where where Mag's fake fingers have been added when they were taken off. Well, it'd be easier to regather if everyone was here, wouldn't it? If we'd been worth staying for. You act like I'm the one who's been missing, but uh, there's a bigger hole than that, isn't there? So yeah, let's uh, let's regather ourselves. And he uh, reaches into his pocket and pulls out a coin that was clearly in Mag's pocket, you know, 30 seconds ago. Yeah, let's, let's just put it all back together. You know, I'm the one who uh, decided none of this was worth sticking out. I'm your problem. Let's just fix it all. And Mag's eyes flash briefly red as she fixes Norman's golden ones with a stare. I suppose you're right. You've stayed. He's gone. And if he's gone, he's gone. And so what's our choice? Do we hole up here in town? We find a den to get comfortable in? Perhaps we wait till winter. Or we pick ourselves up and carry on with what? And she reaches down to her belt and picks up the dagger of venom from Vadim, gives it a flip in her hand and catches the handle again with what we have and who we have. She steps back and turns to Trill. We may not be four, but we are three. We can't keep hiding here forever. Hiding? You think I'm hiding? Well, I'm not hiding, mad girl. When he comes back, he's going to realize what a mistake he made. We were worth staying for. Norman. Trill finally pipes up. He's not coming back. You know that, right? Trill finds that Norman won't won't meet her gaze. And instead, he's sort of fumbling around with something in his pocket that she realizes are the thieves' tools that Vadim left him. And this awkward moment between the three of you is interrupted when you hear a commotion happening a little ways down the road, just at the edge of the bridge in front of Crook's Nook. And you see a person on the street asking questions. At this moment, he's turning away from an overwhelmed elderly woman the woman shakes her head apologetically as this man walks towards you. Armat, what does this person look like? Well, 
They see a gentleman in his late 20s who moves with the easy grace of an experienced combatant. He has short, sleek, bright blue hair with a neatly trimmed beard, also blue, and pointed ears that mark him out as a half-elf. In his hand, he carries an elegant wizard staff with subtle twisting carvings and what look like well-worn reinforced steel caps for striking at either end. Chained to his belt is what appears to be a spellbook or grimoire, along with various pouches, charms, talismans, and, and what looks like feathers. He's wearing a pair of soft leather boots, a blue tabard that complements his hair, and leather trousers, all of which are garlanded with the various straps and attachment points that would allow him to integrate chainmail and a full set of plate armor. His eyes are green and rove about constantly, missing nothing, taking in the various sights Otari has to offer with an evident amusement. And he sees the party and their argument. And something flashes in his eyes. It's recognition. And he goes, Hey, well, there you are. I've been looking all over for you. I was just speaking with Morlebit and Karth. Gosh, what a lovely pair of gentlemen they are. Aren't they such a wonderful couple? They had such wonderful things to say about you. Uh, but anyway, I was coming to look to you because you killed my dad. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. You knew my dad. It... That was a bit rude of me, wasn't it? I'm Istanavel Volus. And just call me Istan, though. I never liked the name Istanavel. It always sounded to me like <laughs> what you'd call a coup, you know? Oh, Istanavel, you're putting out good milk, aren't you? Anyway, I've lost loads of companions, so don't worry about it, you know? Uh, you know, like, I just lost a crew that I was part of to a vampire. Oh, God, what a... Horrible wipe that was. Three people dead. Can you believe it? I can. I saw them. Uh, you may have heard of me from the Chalaxian Caper, uh, the Purloined Pooches. Uh, you might know it by its alternate name, the Damn Dog Whisperer of Isger. Anyways, seeing if there's any. No? I feel like while he's in the midst of this, um, Norman turns, catches Mag's eye, winks very discreetly and becomes uh, a waiter. Wait, you just put on a new disguise? You just, you just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just sort of just like... The signifiers of, of being a waiter. Um, and rams into this guy, knocking the wind out of him and knocking him to the ground, uh, and then <laughs> s skirts off behind the nearest building, leaving Mag and Trill to deal with this fellow with, with you know, the wind rammed out of him. <laughs> and as he's on the ground... Panting, be like, oh, oh. well, I just want to say, this guy is wearing full plate armor. This creates a ruckus like you would not believe when he falls <laughs> I over. I think that's right. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Like lots of banging. So Mag, a step slower than Norman, realizes as the as the wink happens and the costume change that Norman is about to get into some mischief, and so she's just just a couple of steps behind after Norman knocks into this uh, poor fellow. Um, she kneels down next to the gentleman, grabs him under the top section of his breastplate, and wrenches him up so that he's sitting up where he is, and whispers to him, Did you say... Volus? Yes, but don't worry. Honestly, we weren't close. Uh, I grew up mostly in Absalom with my mom in Manan. So anyway, I barely knew him. I came here maybe once or twice. I think first when I was 10. No, I was 11. And then again when I was 16. Yeah. So anyway, it's not surprising uh, that I, we weren't uh, on the best of terms. He and my mom had a thing and then it wasn't a thing. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, anyway, so when are we leaving? Point of order. Who's Volus? I've forgotten. Haplo. This is oh. Haplo's son. I totally missed the name of Haplo in any of this. He didn't say Haplo. Yeah. He just said Volus. Trill does, has, so back to the game. Uh, <laughs> Trill has not made this connection. Now that Robin understands it, Trill still like, she just, I don't know why maybe she never fully remembered Haplo's whole long name, but she just is looking like, who the hell is Volus? What? 
He looks kind of familiar, but... but who the hell are you? Oh, did I not say I'm Istin. Uh, like Tristan, but without the Trist, it's more just the Istin. Uh, okay, but wh why are you here? Uh, and he's distracted looking at Mag, who's pulled them up and going, Wow, you're strong. Do you arm wrestle? I'd love to arm wrestle hey, you no, sometime. No, you, you, you're the Tristan without the Trist. Oh, yes, that's me. Hello. In the middle of this, um, <laughs> out comes um, uh, a person in a, a lab coat with a thick blonde wig and a canine face. Uh, Dr. Morticia Montgomery here to cure the patient. Ayo, um, ayo. <laughs> Enough. <laughs> Enough. We well, get it. You're good at medicine now. <laughs> that's ill. Then he looks at Trill. You must be Magdaruna Lacewing Skull Crusher, and you <laughs> are Trillfus Hutalov, he says, returning to Mag. It is an absolute delight to meet the pair yes. Mag is um, <laughs> is uh, is she's squeezing one of the the hafts of one of her throwing hammers so hard <laughs> <laughs> that the the wood is warping. This is just this is way more. Mag likes when one person at a time speaks. You know, Mag and Lars. Those are the two people. It's on weird. This game it's the, it's the one thing we have in common. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. It, Magda Runa Crosstalk Skull Crusher. Istin, was it? Uh, Istin, yes. Istin, Istin. Why are you here? Why did you come looking for us? Oh, a fantastic question. Getting right to the heart of it, Mag. So uh. I came here <laughs> because you knew my dad. I was told you, you were adventuring with him hey. at the time of his death, and I was hoping I could get to know him a bit, perhaps by, you know, walking in your shoes, seeing where he'd met his ends, thinking about how if I had been there, what I might have done, I probably would have cast a spell. I'll tell you that right now. Anyway. Are you looking for something to do in town? You want... You want something to do? Absolutely. I'm glad you got to the heart of it. Come on, let's go. And he gets up and starts striding the exact wrong way to the dungeon. Uh, um, and Ao <laughs> links arms with him and heads towards nothing bunk kobold. Is this way to the dungeon? I have to admit, I have oh. not fully explored. Yes, yes. Are you interested in uh, something where you can turn your abilities into upwards of 400 or 500% return yield uh, within a matter of months, thereby benefiting the people of Otari with better nutrition, essential oils and lavender, eucalyptus, and nighttime shade tree all by selling cakes that look like Mag Magdaruna, who you bet back there. Uh, are is you that turning him into doTERRA? Are you making an MLM? Yeah, I don't know That's how right. I didn't see it coming that, that AO was going to start, or that Norman was going to start an MLM, but I certainly should <laughs> have seen that coming. Obviously, nothing bunk kobold was an MLM. I didn't I mean, for the long time, you guys have just been sitting on that. We're just catching up to her game. It's a long con. That's, that's how MLMs work. You don't know that you're in you one until You don't know until, until Ishtin shows in. up in town, and then he's part of the MLM. And all of a sudden, there's 150 bucks worth of Herbalife samples yeah. sitting on your bedroom floor. <laughs> Uh, no, no, I'm not interested in that. Uh, I am interested in seeing where my father died, if you don't mind. We weren't close, but I would like to sort of put myself in his shoes, as it were. I'm here in town, mm -hmm, really, mm -hmm. to sort of now, settle his final... Now, do you mean... I hear you, I hear you. Do you mean the first time or the second time that we killed him? Like, I was just going for pure shock value now. You killed him twice! We did. Oh, well, there's a story there I need to hear. No! No! Oh, Trill, don't act like we've processed this. We had to do away with his undead corpse that was risen from the dead. We did not kill him. Fascinating. Well, it sounds like you have been having quite the adventure, and I would dearly love to hear more about it. As we go to the dungeon, eh, any takers, any takers? He points to Mac Trillfus, eh? I'm, I'm Trill. Really? Oh, well, it is a delight to meet you. And he does a low, like, <laughs> elaborate bow, uh, tucking his staff behind him, and then tosses it up on his shoulder. Right, so we're off, right? I'm, I'm weirdly charmed, okay? <laughs> um, and Mag, 
who has been um, skulking a little bit behind <laughs> this uh, incredible display. Um, closes the distance between them and says, that's right. She's Trill. <laughs> I'm Magdaruna Skullcrusher. Here's a reminder. And she slings the maul off of her shoulder and in a single motion, hefts it high above her head, leaves it paused just a moment at its apex, and then brings it down very heavily onto a rock nearby, which is crushed to sand. Wow, that was a strike there. I can do strikes too. Come on, I bet I can kill more monsters in the dungeon than you can. Uh, takers, first round is on the loser. How's it sound? Yes? No? Young elves are weird. Well, half elf, just half. <laughs> it sounds like the right idea. <laughs> and I'll also have you know, well, we act with discipline. And we act with forethought. And we act with care for our mission and for one another. So... You're welcome to join. We'll have any of your skill and your enthusiasm with us. But don't act rashly. Throughout the mag speech, um, Ao has been using Mage Hand to feel in Ishthan's... Ishthan, yeah? Ishthan. Ish, Ishthan. Just like Ishthan. Uh, Ishthan, okay. In no, Ishthan's... No, th- just ta. Ta. Uh, just yeah. Ishthan. Ta. Ishthan. Ishthan. Um... <laughs> In Istin's pockets to try and one, see if there's anything of value she can steal, and two, see if there's any. Do- She's like det- um, sensing motive, right? Like checking to make sure he is who he says he is. Like, can she find any? Oh, sure. Documentation. Yeah. On him? Here's what I'm going to tell you. The first thing that your mage ha- hand discovers is that this dude is jacked. The muscles in his legs, as you are like frisking him with your mage hand. You, you realize that this guy, in addition to having this voluminous knowledge about all of these different topics he's, he's telling you about, is built like an Olympic athlete. So he's, you, you might say he's not a dex build. He's a strength build. <laughs> he seems to not be a dex build. Uh, someone learned certain lessons from that kerfuffle. The Ustalavian upset. Y- you see nothing to indicate that he is lying to you about any part of this. Shall we head on? And this time starts walking what he thinks is the right direction to the uh, dungeon towards the docks. Oh, God, is he? He's not that bright, is he? She says to Mag. (laughs) He knows a lot, but oh, my God. Trill and Trill kind of runs after him and grabs him and also then notices the strength that, uh, that the mage hand was able to figure out. She kind of paused goes, oh, you're a, ooh, you're a bit strong, aren't you? Why, why don't you uh, take my hand and walk with me and I'll lead you the right way. Oh, with pleasure. And he does another sort of <laughs> elaborate formal bow and uh, walks with Trill towards Gauntlet. Oh, I, I kind of like him. I think Ao's walking a, a solid 20 feet behind <laughs> unwilling to miss out like it's like a FOMO situation but super not into this and like perhaps um, zapping foxfire into plants and like lighting them up and then sort of <laughs> like tossing water on them to get out her frustration at the whole thing and after about a 20 minute walk which I'm sure is punctuated by many digressions and uh, <laughs> anecdotes Trill noticing how strong he is. I also think on the walk, um, he'd like to, he'd be asking about uh, the party's adventures in Gauntlet and to be caught up on their uh, stories of uh, trials and tribulations and triumphs. Trill sings a few verses she's written. I I don't have them right now, but Trill, uh, yeah, Trill plays a bit of music and sings some songs of their travels and adventures all bard-like. Oh, it's then claps along sort of off rhythm and tries to do a little shuffle step, but 
It's not, not a dex filled. <laughs> yeah, out. not a dex filled. <laughs> just, it's plate just, art and Just clients. stand there and be pretty. Just walk there and be pretty. Okay. <laughs> As the final lines of Trill's song reverberate out from her lute, the four of you look around and you realize that you are standing outside that outbuilding on the ground floor of Gauntlet where Haplo met his doom. Um, so, are are you sure you want to go in here? Yeah, of course. Your dad died in there. Ao shouts from the back. Very helpful, thank you. I mean, there's not much in here. We took everything. And he walks in. The bunch of glass. Looks around. Careful. Yeah, Istin walks in to this um study where you first met Tangletop and and he notices I really wanted Tangletop to be back just haunting us and he hears a voice <laughs> call out step, step back, back. <laughs> it is I, I the spooky wisp wispy, 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 wispy ghost be gone Tangletop we know it's you oh Oh, oh, he and Tangletop, this small fey creature with a mass of, uh, you know, he's about knee high with a mass of blonde tangled hair, hops out from behind this bookshelf and says, oh, it's, uh, it's you again, the, the humans and gnomes. And he looks at Istin and he says, I thought that guy was dead. <laughs> so... You're the fiend that killed my father. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, 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 no. No, I didn't kill him. L let me tell you, these three idiots killed him. Uh, they went into this other room, they got into a fight with this mean doll, and then they carried you, your body away. Uh, Tangletop, if you want to get technical about it, you're the one who convinced us to go in there. Hmm, is that being technical? I suppose it is. I guess that makes sense. Well, I guess no harm, no foul, since you're alive again. Welcome back to being alive, my man. Oh, thank you. It's actually quite nice to be alive. But no, it's not me. I'm uh, the son. But, uh, you know, no need to get awkward about it. We weren't close. I didn't know him very well. Uh, like I said, I only spent a couple uh, summers here, and I, I doubt anyone in town really uh, knew enough about me to contact me or me mom or me nan. In, well, uh, I certainly Absalom. don't know. I just live here in the the, bu the bookshelf. Oh, well, I am Istin. It's a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> uh, is, I'm sorry. Is it Istin or Istin? Oh, Istin. Yes, you got it. Okay, well, I'm Tangletop. Um, let me introduce you to my lover. And he pulls out another fey creature. He says, this is Gentle Tooth. And they nod oh, at no. you. And, <laughs> oh, dude. and he uh, and he snaps his fingers and three more fey creatures pour out of this bookshelf. Oh. And he says, and our, yep. our three children, uh, Little Head, Big Knees, and Rosie. Hello, Rosie. It is a pleasure to meet your are entire they, clan. Were they all here last Triplets? time? Wait, are, I'm sorry. Two different questions. Were they here last <laughs> time and are they gremlins? Are we gremlins? Is that the question? No, triplets. 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 And oh, triplets. under her breath, Mag mutters, all of this Cross talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the question is this. No, uh, Gentle Tooth and I began our, our um, carnal communion uh, <laughs> relatively recently, <laughs> and we were blessed with three uh, near the timings of their birth. We're quite, pro had some closeness, but not, not triplets, not by brownie terms, at least. I, gosh, I, I don't want to go down this whole rabbit hole, but how long is brownie gestation? Well, the funny thing that it's funny you mentioned going down the rabbit hole because that's exactly how it happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Istin, <laughs> gentle tooth nods silently. With this, Ao has, has traversed down the hallway to the left. Okay, um, we'll see I you later. Um, good, good to see you again. Uh, hope you don't get this one killed too, or get the same one killed again. I'm still not quite sure. Um, I'll be here in the bookshelf. And you hear 
one of the three children say, Daddy, who are those people? <laughs> They're <laughs> evil <laughs> monsters who killed their friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it was gone down past the portrait of Volek Azenray that's in the hallway um, to the doorway to the the room where Haplo died. I believe like right in that. Yeah, Haplo right. died right on the th- right in this hallway leading into the lens workshop of Volek Azrene. As the chatter from these brownies uh, reverberates in the study behind you. And you sm- you see a small blood stain on the stone floor in front of the portraits of Belcora Haravex and the defaced portrait of Volek Azrene. And of course, also, the landscape showing the city of Absalom being destroyed by ghosts rising from the city streets in flames. This was it. You wanted to come here? This was it. And Ao's like sort of suddenly uh, emotional. It it was right here. And she points to the bloodstain. I mean, this whole place, we don't even know... It's going gonna, it's gonna to take weeks or months or, or years to figure out what that light is doing. And she points to the picture. Like, none, none of this is really a narrative except in her mind. It, it, the light, it's the light that can speak to us. And it tells us, it can tell you what to do and it can make things happen. And if we could just figure out what it wants from us and give it what it wants, we'll be able, uh, there won't be any more. And she points at the blood stain. We just need people who, who care enough about figuring out what to do with the light to to keep it from doing that. And she points at the picture of the ghost coming out of the grave. We can, we can control it. It, it, it. I can control it. But that's where it was. And she points at the bloodstain again and sort of stares out into the room with her eyes kind of glazed over. And Istin is quiet for a moment looks to Ale says Ray, uh, not sure I got all of that but this is where my dad died here yes yes right there right there right and there and it was so fast that's the thing with this place you don't always know what's coming and then someone's dead or they're gone they just leave oh yeah that all happened with adventurers can't rely on them really uh, follow-up question. And he points to the picture of Absalom in flame, uh, like swarmed with a nightmare of ghosts. That's what you're trying to prevent, yeah? And she, she like turns suddenly keen on him. That's what we're trying to control. Ooh. Can we stick with prevent? My nan lives in Absalom, and I got to say, <laughs> I really... I don't think she'd take to co- ghosts. I, I just don't think she'd cotton to him. I'm sorry. It, it's just, it's nothing against ghosts. You know, I'm sure there are some ghosts out there that are perfectly lovely. Well, they're not people, but they're perfectly lovely is my point. Some uh, were people. They were people. Former people. Ex-people. So anyway, what floor were you on? How, how you know about the, f- oh, I guess you know about the floors from me, from the songs. Yeah. It sounds like what you're doing here is... And he looks briefly at the blood stain on the floor. Important work. Uh, if it's, that's what you're trying to prevent. We're, we're trying to save everyone. Well, some of them you could lose, that's for sure. But who are we to decide? Oh, I'm pretty good on deciding. <laughs> I have a number picked out I would be not sorry to see. Let me tell you. Oh, okay. Let's, um... Hey, are you... You doing okay? You ready to solve some mysteries? And then Ao sort of looks at Trill and has like a very sort of sallow smile on her face. And she goes, yeah, potato, potato. Um, in, in reference to the prevent versus um, control discussion, <laughs> but perhaps somewhat cryptically. Well, that sounds like it's decided then. Hey there, Magdaruna. What do you see? First round on the tavern. Whoever kills the most monsters, eh? 
Whoever prevents the most of that, says Mag and points at the picture. And Istin smiles and says, fair play to you, your own. And wandering down the hallway, Ao mumbles to herself, whoever can control the light. So, as the four of you push down into the dungeons below Gauntlet, where would you like to start your investigation from? I'm trying to remember what the map looks like down there. Oh, you're loading it. Yeah, so on the fifth floor, there were a couple of rooms that you have not yet explored, but you have seen the, the doors to. There is a door that you have not yet opened near Chafkem's office, the mummy that was the former arena administrator. There is on the hallway where you faced the specter that took control of Mag, the most recent fight that you had. That hallway continued to the south, a 10 foot wide hallway continuing down for some distance. And those are the main leads that you have now that you have not yet explored. Aside from the doors lurking within that chamber in which Vadim set off that trap with the spinning blades, which seems like it is potentially not the safest place to go. I am okay with going back to the hall we never finished um, going through. I don't know, it's them what calls to you, huh? Anything that I can do to uh, outdo this in here, eh? 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 Oh, he sees it's not really landing. He goes, all right then. So the four of you work your way down these five flights of stairs, weaving past the library, past Belcora Haravex's personal chambers and dining room and so on on the fourth floor. And you find yourselves in this 10 foot wide hallway after passing through a large room filled with chains and a, a pit opening up into the floor below. And there are two open doors on your east and west, the door leading into the surgical room where you fought the specter and a door leading off to the east where you found some supplies. The hallway extends to the south. Well, do those stairs lead down? There's an intersection here. There's a hallway leading off to the east and then a, a short set of, of stairs leading down underneath, underneath what looks like another tunnel leading from the east-west. This is not like a full set of stairs leading down. It's just a, a small recess down into a lower landing on this arena floor. Well, uh... You know this dungeon better than I. Do you want to go left, or do you want to go straight ahead and down? I'd rather see you on this level first, get to know you before we start heading further down. Left it is! And he strides confidently off with uh, not a whole lot of uh, worry or thought. Ao under her breath again goes, we call it clockwise. And you you find yourselves moving to the east a little bit and standing on a platform overlooking a grand concourse. It's a stately hallway stretching from the north to the south uh, as far as your light is able to see. You're on a, a platform, like a, a walkway looking out over what looks like a grand concourse. And in front of you, there is a bridge crossing across that recessed grand hallway that leads off to the east you can tell from your exploration of this floor already that that would lead you back towards the area around Chafkim's office and where you faced the mimics but this walkway leading down to the south seems as though it has another passageway leading off of that as well so you can potentially head back towards the eastern side of this floor or head down this strange pathway leading to the south. And am I um, kind of reckoning and navigating right that down to the south is also where we confronted the basilisks? Yes. Mag extends her wayfinder out over the railing, looking out over this grand concourse. And you get the sense that this wide hallway 
that you're looking down 20 feet into is the hallway that the basilisks were set up at the entrance towards. So if Mag's light were able to look just a little bit further, she's confident that you would see the arena to the south with the shifting Shanrigal behemoth ambulating throughout. Do I hear something down there? No. Should we go that way? Nope. 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 You you don't hear anything. Just she grabs him, his waistband. But as you step down in that in that direction, you you see yourselves looking into the that recessed stair that you just saw a while ago. You get the sense that you see the bridge leading across that. So it's sort of a figure eight of a hallway that you're that you're seeing, and there is a ten foot wide hallway leading off to the west from here. So, not south. How about west? Trill can, walks on. Okay. Oh, it's getting a bit dark down here. Could you bring the light? Um. Oh, what? Oh, he's got a. You've got a staff, don't you? Yeah. It's not. It's really crap at light, though. I, I don't do that. Trill so uh, and Trill cast light on the staff. Oh, thank you. And if one were looking at Ao, you might notice that Fraum is glowing just enough to be helpful to her, but not to Isthen. So, so Ao, sorry, is is Trill casting light on the staff? Yes, Trill casts light on the staff, like she used to do on uh, Vigilance. So Trill oh. st- touches touches the staff, and it illuminates with light, revealing in front of Isthen a hallway leading off to the west that ends with a closed portcullis. The light from his staff casting a like a zoetrope of shadows on the far side of these bars of this portcullis in front of him. Have you gone through here? No. No, this is this is a mystery. Ooh, I do love a mystery. I'll bet you do, Ale mumbles to herself. <laughs> Can we find a way through these bars? Yeah, Istin takes a close look at the bars and sees that they appear to be partially melted. Hmm. Ooh. Taking a closer look at these bars, he, he gets the sense that, that this, this portcullis here could either be lifted or somebody very small could slip through. But he he knows that he's too big to get through this gap in the melted bars. Would Trilfus fit? Trilfus gets the sense that she could fit with a little bit of work. She could try to slip through with acrobatics. Yeah, Trill decides to try and wiggle her way through. Okay, so the four of you approach this portcullis. Istin notices that some of the bars are melted, and Trill attempts to flip through using her acrobatics. And did an acrobatics check. So that was a 27. So Trill is able to very easily tumble through this gap created by the uh, the melted sections of the bar of the bars as she's passing between this gap she smells what's what seems to be a powerful acid as though some kind of acid melted one of these bars it smells pretty bad in here uh, trill starts looking around to see if there's any way from this side to pull up the portcullis so trill notices that on this side there are there's a set of double doors behind her. She's sandwiched between these lowered portcullis bars and this set of double doors, but she notices that on her side of the portcullis, as she looks out across the bars to the other three in the party, that there are arrow slits leading off to the north and south. Like a small gap in the yeah. in the stone that Troll she could, goes to investigate. Sure. And she looks first to the north and then to the south and sees that both of these seem to be guard chambers that would have been uh, stationed with archers to protect this door, just like the portcullis is meant to protect uh, the door. 
She looks into both of these chambers and sees cobwebs strung between the walls on either side. And from this vantage point, that's all she's able to see. Is there any way to um, dismantle the portcullis, uh, you know, taking a or look at its mechanism it? and couldn't it be... Mag looks at this and gets the sense that she could potentially lift this open. No. Oh. Is there any sign that it might have any kind of a booby trap? Mag starts searching around for traps and doesn't see anything. All right. Um, Mag will... Um, I guess she's going to need to... Uh, It'll be an athletics check. Yeah, and she's going to need to put down her, or, you know, strap her weapons back to her back. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll give it a shot. Um, can Isten aid Mag sure. in that attempt? Yes. Awesome. I'm also imagining that now all exploration is unendurable because Isten is just prattling on. <laughs> like the urge to get this thing done quickly so that he stops telling a story about like the bar brawl with a half orc back in Absalom or whatever just ends. Yeah, I don't know if you I don't know if you have to imagine that very hard. The funny thing about that is though we ended up such good friends. We still correspond. Show up that athletics check. Yeah, the aid, the aid, the athletics. I, I'll aid. take the aid. Yeah. That, we can do the aid first. Man, Matt's really leaning. Yeah, Matt, you're really leaning into the whole wanting to be fired thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's what I do best. <laughs> He's the best at what he does, and what he does is not very good. <laughs> okay, so let's get that aid first. Uh, 26. All right, so that's a success. So that's going to be a plus one to Mag's athletics track. And that is a 29 for Mag with the plus one, I guess, makes it a 30. Okay. That's so to do it, right? Yeah, absolutely. The two of you start working together, grabbing a hold of these bars, uh, lifting, of course, with your knees. Yes. And you're able to form. together just shove this creaking... Like bits of rust powder start flaking off of the the portcullis as it starts moving through these holes in the ceiling, and you shove it up slowly at first, and then slamming it upwards. The two of you side by side, lodging it in place as it creates a pathway forward for you. So that's what it's like to have two strength builds. <laughs> and now. The four of you are all looking at this double door leading off to the west. Well, I think Mag is ready to open it up. You ready for your first new door, Ishton? Oh, I love a new door. Let's see what's behind it, eh? And he pushes the door open. And as you push the door open, you, for a moment find yourselves looking into a octagonal room. Just like a brief second, the doors slide open, you look into, into an octagonal room, and then suddenly you hear the sound of a magic spell being cast, and you just see darkness in front of you. All light is removed from the room. Can we see anything at all, or is it just complete blackness in there? You can see nothing. It's like a, a curtain of blackness on the door as you walk in, or as you does, open the door and look in a brief moment later. Does that a, extend? I feel like Ale hung right in the door frame as everyone else went in. Does that extend outside the room? Ao looks at the darkness for a second, and it's just like a rolling curtain of blackness passes past her. All of you are are in complete shadow, just no no light that you can see in front of you. And you just hear the sound of a sword trailing along the stone floor. And you hear a whisper from within the darkness in front of you. Yes. Come closer. And we will pick up from there next time maybe we should leave <laughs> i'm i'm one foot out the door already <laughs> i get the sense Istan's gonna stay <laughs> the 
Roots of Ruin is a Tabletop Gold production produced under the Paizo Incorporated Community Use Policy. The Roots of Ruin uses trademarks and or copyrights owned by Paizo Inc. used under Paizo's Community Use Policy. We are expressly prohibited from charging you to use or access this content. Paizo does not recognize, endorse, or sponsor this project in any way. Original characters and content are the property of Tabletop Gold. For more information about Paizo Inc. and Paizo products, visit paizo.com. We at Tabletop Gold would love to hear from you. Email us at letters at tabletopgold.com and find all our social links at tabletopgold.com. <laughs>